Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC Television Podcast brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Casey. So, kind of uh, breaking into it really quick, but before we actually get started, I just wanted to give you a little backstory on me, given that this is my first podcast for the GSMC Podcast Network. Um, I originally went to film school. Um, I graduated with a concentration in both directing and editing. Uh, Primarily, I I do editing work. But while I was there, um, they do a very large uh, junior year production. And that's like the really big requirement before you graduate. And so they sort of forced me into a position of doing sound, both uh, production and post-production sound. And while I was there, I hadn't previously taken any sound classes. So they had to give me a crash course on all sound work over the course of probably what would have been the equivalent of about three hours. And they gave me some like paperwork, you know, some basics of, you know, operations and settings and stuff like that. Um, But originally speaking, if I would have taken the class, that would have been at least a whole semester class. Um, There are multiple sound classes, but... And they're pretty expensive, too. But I was actually kind of fortunate to get, you know, a free class out of it. But it was actually great that I was forced into that role because um, during the final two years of college as well as after college, it actually helped me land a number of, you know, jobs, you know, working, you know, and and helping tighten up sound for certain edits. Um, so... I've been listening to podcasts for years now, but it's really been the past like year that I've wanted to really do a podcast, and so probably about a month ago, I started just kind of recording and producing and talking to people about, you know, doing podcasts, um, and then this came along just as I was getting started, so this is an awesome opportunity that I have been, you know, afforded. Um, so... That's just a little bit about me, Um, but for today's episode, um, I have four segments that I want to hop into. Um, First off, we'll kick it off with WandaVision. It's been a week since the finale, so I figured that's enough time to, you know, publicly discuss the finale. Um, Then I want to talk about some of the new shows that have come out uh, during the 2021 uh, spring lineup that I've been watching. Um, Then after that, some of my general shows in my lineup, I watch a lot of television, but these are the shows that come out uh, during the daily week, not things that are, you know, released on streaming services um, exactly, that are, you know, put all out at once. And then uh, for my final segment, which I find to be a very interesting segment, so you should definitely tune in for it, are uh, five hidden gems that I've actually started this year. You'll definitely want to listen to that. All right, so jumping right into it, we're just going to go uh, into to WandaVision. So I'm going to kind of run through the episode pretty quickly, and then we will talk about, uh, you know, my, my thoughts and, and people's thoughts as well on this finale. So uh, as we saw in the beginning, uh, which also was left off on episode 8, Agatha has Wanda's children um, tied up around the neck really and they are talking to each other and you know Agatha says that you know what Wanda is showing is is the chaos magic um which is prophesized in the uh Darkhold book 
I guess, as the Scarlet Witch, which is actually the first time in Episode 8, that was the first time we had ever heard Wanda's superhero name, which had been used in the comics, which is really interesting because as we saw throughout the episode, she was really took on the form that is Scarlet Witch, but a little bit more of an updated form. So um, as they're, you know, you know, yelling at each other and, and starting to fight uh, what I like to call spectral vision, or as some people are calling just the vision or white vision, he comes in and, uh, you know, tries to attack Wanda, who then the fabricated vision, the one that we've known all season, comes in to fight spectral vision and they, you know, cause destruction in the small town while Agatha and Wanda really get into it. Uh, while all this is going on, we have Monica, who also is a superhero name in the comic. Many superhero names, uh, but primarily, I believe, known as Photon. Uh, she gets captured by Pietro, who we end up finding out is actually an actor named Ralph Boner. Um he was being controlled by an enchanted necklace that Agatha had put on him. Um, so the fight between Agatha and Wanda, you know, continues on and they go into the town center and Agatha, you know, takes the spell off all the citizens. As the citizens get really upset, they start to surround Wanda and let her know about, you know, what she has been doing to them. Uh, which kind of causes Wanda to, you know, break down a little bit more. Um, but she tries to plead with them and, you know, offer, you know, reason behind her actions, you know, why she did what she did. Uh, but she decides to open up the barrier and allow them escape. Um, but as that is happening, we have um, Billy and Tommy and uh, the children of Wanda's and Vision who start to disintegrate. So then she has to close the barrier, which when the barrier is closed uh, or is open, I mean, the uh, sword personnel led by uh, Hayward start to flood in. Now, given how large that barrier is, there's no way that those citizens were able to escape. I mean, if they were lucky, they were able to maybe run a thousand feet before that barrier had to snap back. Um, so, Vision continues to fight Spectral Vision when a comment sort of strikes a nerve with Spectral Vision. Um, and so, the Vision we knew offers a thought experiment or, or brings up the thought experiment of the ship of Theseus. And, um, you know, which is essentially, as they do kind of quickly touch upon, um, you know, it's about if you take, you know, the original ship of Theseus and as the wood's rotting over the years, you replace all of it. And then at some point or another, every single part of that ship that ever existed in the original form was replaced by new stuff. Is it truly that ship? And obviously they're talking about spectral vision. Um, so after a little bit more conversation, uh, the vision once again that we knew activates spectral vision's memories. Because at the end of the day, spectral vision still is, you know, the real vision. He's just kind of been reprogrammed, and he, he did die. I mean, we saw him die twice in Infinity War, uh, which, after he gets his memories back, he then flies away, flies outside the hex. Um, then we go back, and we see, you know, Monica now is free, and she's with the children. They're taken on sword and the personnel, while Wanda and Agatha are still fighting, and then... Um, Agatha gets trapped, which we've seen Wanda do plenty of times. She has trapped Agatha in a memory of hers in the, uh, you know, the uh, Salem witch trials. So with all that, she ends up breaking free. And, you know, she says that her power is, you know, that she absorbs other people's powers, which happened in the flashback sequence when she did that to her mom and the rest of the witches. We'd seen that earlier in the episode. Um, but the really cool thing is at, the climax of the episode 
they're fighting and Wanda's saying she's given all of her power to Agnes, but she's actually casting the runes inside the hex, which then disables Agatha's powers because only the witch that casts the runes can cast magic within that area, and she traps her in that, that body. Um, she ends up, you know, letting everyone go. Um, we get a quick little cameo by Darcy who traps Hayward in a car so he can be arrested and sort of all, you know, all's well again. Um, Wanda gets to say goodbye to Vision. She gets to say goodbye to her children as they disappear. And then, you know, she leaves. So we have two, um, post credit scenes, which, um, We'll start off with the first one, which, I mean, give you a little bit of synopsis, but we're just going to dive right into it with this one. So we see that Hayward gets arrested, Darcy's fled, which is unfortunate because we didn't really get much of Darcy, and I know a lot of people really love Darcy's character, especially, you know, in the Thor movies, which is what she was originally introduced in. Um, So... Monica then gets pulled aside by one of the FBI agents and they go into a movie theater who then reveals to be a scroll um, and says that a friend of her mother's wants to meet her and the scroll points up. Now, for those that are familiar with other post credit sequences, we saw that Nick Fury was last in a space station, um, obviously somewhere in space. Uh, and we saw that you know, Nick Fury, you know, knows the scroll from Captain Marvel. And so that could mean one of two things. The friend of her mother's that, you know, wants to meet her or talk to her could either be Nick Fury or it could be the uh, leader or the general, whoever that guy truly is of the scroll that we got to see in Captain Marvel. His name was uh, uh, Talos or Talos. Um, it's one of those two, which clearly is going to lead into the Captain Marvel film. Now, I think realistically, if we get to see Monica again, which I'm sure we will, we're going to see her in one of two things. We're either going to see her in the next Captain Marvel movie, or we're going to see her in the Nick Fury show. For those who don't know, Nick Fury will be getting his own show. They have like 20 different shows planned. We're about to get a flood of Marvel content. Uh, it would have been awesome if we would have had that content last year when there were no movies that come out because they kept being pushed back but i mean it is what it is so we're going to see her in one of those two um maybe even both you know so then we have in the second sequence uh we had a post credit scene where wanda is now in hiding somewhere she's got her own little cabin and we see her you know she's making like hot chocolate or tea or whatever and just kind of enjoying nature while in the back of her house she was astral projecting to study the dark hole and you can hear her children calling out to her uh which is something that we had seen in doctor strange we saw that doctor strange would astral project to be able to study while also training to do other things or doing other activities so, you know, in, in this universe, you have, you know, witches and warlocks, essentially. Um, it's really cool. Uh, and we already do know, too, from the mention uh, by Agatha earlier, either in this episode or the episode before, but Wanda is more powerful than the Sorceress Supreme, which I believe actually she mentioned it in, in this finale episode. So anyway, I mean, we kind of got to talk about the, the, you know, the two post credit scenes, which I guess I'll actually end on this one. Uh, with that, too, we're going to obviously see Scarlet Witch in the new Doctor Strange movie. Aside from the similarities between them two, there were references to Doctor Strange throughout the series, and we also have confirmation she's going to be in there. Now... I think we're going to probably see her as the hero. She had her her breakdown and her moment where she was kind of a little bit villainous in this show, but obviously she was not the villain of the show. Uh, I know some people, you know, speculate she will be the villain in the future, but I don't know. I, I don't exactly see it. Uh, I mean, it supposedly prophesies that she's going to be the villain or she's going to end the world or something like that. But I, I don't really see that happening. I just think she's going to have moments, very human moments, where she's not perfect and she's going to make mistakes and she's going to... And other people are going to suffer the consequences of her trying to gain a hold of such, you know, powerful magic, the chaos magic. So going back into this episode, um, 
it is very interesting to actually see Agatha. Um, we saw her, obviously, in the comics. Well, not obviously, but for those who know the comics a little bit, she is in the comics. Um, she does have a sort of villainous uh, role to her in the comics, but I think she's more so a mentor, which I think is something we're also going to get later on in the uh, MCU, uh, because... As they did leave it off on, you know, she was trapping her there and she, and she was like, yeah, if I ever need to, you know, ask you or if I ever need you for something, like, I know where to find you. She's got her trapped in that nosy neighbor role. Um, so I'm I'm sure we're going to see her. And, and a name like Catherine Hahn, yeah, you bet, you bet we're going to see her again. Um, going to the Pietro storyline, it was kind of a shame that he ended up just being some actor with a really crappy last name that clearly was just a corny joke. Um, cause I think that could have been a really good introduction now that, uh, Disney slash Marvel has acquired most, if not all the rights to, uh, 20th century's properties, uh, which includes X-Men and he had played Quicksilver in that X-Men universe. So we also know that, you know, Dr. Strange and Scarlet Witch, they're no stranger to multiple dimensions in the comics. So they could have pulled him from, you know, another universe or whatever. And we're getting Deadpool too. And the Deadpool we're going to be getting in this MCU with this third Deadpool movie is the same Deadpool that was in the first two movies. They're not going to reshoot those. Those movies are being incorporated into the MCU. And he, as it was shown in the second movie, um, they showed the X-Men people from the most recent movies. So it really shouldn't have been outside the realm of possibilities for them to do that, but it is what it is. I know a lot of people were upset about that. I was disappointed, but I'm over it. Um, so going to Vision, so something interesting with Vision, uh, you know, is that obviously he got his memories back and he could potentially be on the course to become the real Vision again. And, you know, part of that is his programming, but part of it is his memories. So he's got his memories back. Now let's see if we can rewire him. Now I think it would be pretty safe to say that with him flying away, where would he be going? And I, I think he'd probably be going to Wakanda. The very last memories that he had was him dying in Wakanda twice. So with that too, you have to think about uh, Shuri. I think that's how you say her name. The sister of Black Panther, who is insanely smart, is probably the smartest character we've been introduced to yet in the MCU. So I think it's pretty clear that, you know, Vision probably went there. He probably wants to see the site where he died and also maybe to see if she can reprogram him to make him whole again. So I think that could be really fun, but we're probably not going to see him for a while because if we do see him in something, it would be something like Black Panther. I doubt we'll see him in Doctor Strange and Black Panther is not slated to come out till it's at least sometime next year. Um, but I think that more or less covers everything. I mean, I think with the, you know, her studying the dark hold, she'll probably find a way to get her children back. And I think Vision will come back, you know, on his own. And, uh, Hayward's locked up. I, I really like the ending. I, I know there were some mixed reviews about it. Um, but I think honestly, most of the people that did not like the ending, it wasn't because it wasn't good, but I think similar to many other series finales is that they're just disappointed in the fact that their theories did not come true. So on that note, we're going to take a quick break and we will be back with our next segment. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden in the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip-hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further, because this is the gold standard in music podcast. <laughs> All 
All right, and we are back. So kind of jumping right into the next segment, uh, which is the new shows that I have been watching during the spring 2021 lineup. Um, so before we actually get into those, I just want to say like a little background kind of on me about how I watch, you know, most TV shows is that in the past I would, you know, anything that kind of piqued my interest, um, I would watch, and if I got to a certain point, regardless of if the show started to go downhill or not, I would kind of watch it to the end. There were very, very few shows that I really stopped watching because of how bad they had gotten. Um, The only one even in the most recent years that comes to light is The Walking Dead. I think I watched about four, no, five and a half, I think I got halfway through the fifth season. And then I, I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, I thought the beginning seasons had such great promise, but after the governor storyline was like done, done, I was ugh, it was a pain. It was very, very difficult to get through. And the main reason why I actually stopped watching it was because I'd fallen behind. And then at that point, I was just like, what am I missing? Like, am, is this going to be... You know, is this is this hurting my life not to watch it anymore? So I didn't watch it. Um, and then in in the past couple years, more specifically, I stopped watching shows um, using the three episode rule, which is exactly how it sounds. You watch the first three episodes of a TV show, and you can usually get a uh, pretty good feel about you know if you're going to like the show or not. Um, in an age where you know, a lot of these shows are or have more concentrated storylines in about 8 to 13 episodes. You can especially tell with them. But then you have shows, you know, that follow the like 18 to 24 episodes in a season, which isn't too often anymore, um, unless it's like a sitcom on, you know, regular network television. Um, you know, then you have something a little bit longer, and, and three episodes still usually can give you a good feel for it. Like, I stopped watching, I mean, I didn't use the three-episode rule, but I watched the whole first season of The Unicorn, uh, and then I stopped after, like, two episodes with this season. I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, yeah, oh goodness, I couldn't do it anymore. But anyway... Uh, jumping into it, there are four shows that kind of caught my interest. There's a couple more, but I haven't started them yet. But of the four that I did start, uh, we have uh, Call Me Cat, Keenan, Young Rock, and The Great North. Uh, I will just go right into it, and I'll, I'll start with Call Me Cat. So uh, if anyone's familiar with The Big Bang Theory, you have the actress Maya Bialik, who played Amy Farrah Fowler in The Big Bang Theory. She now stars in Call Me Cat as the main character, obviously, which is actually based on a British sitcom called Miranda, uh, who the star of that show was Miranda Hart. And so the... I've watched the first couple episodes of the original British one, and I also watched the first three episodes of Call Me Cat. I will say right up front, I stopped watching Call Me Cat. Although I've heard recently that, you know, the show's really grown on, you know, some of the people that I know that do watch it. But at this point, I'm I'm not wasting any time jumping back into it, at least not now. Maybe in the future, if it really gets much better. But... I think Mom Bialik is a good actress. You know, she she can definitely, you know, do comedy. You know, I, I couldn't really see her in a serious role, but I, I, I think she's got the chops to do comedy shows. But with the American version versus the BBC version, um, the British version is actually really funny. It is that really awkward humor sometimes inappropriate sometimes really dry and I mean there's still moments that don't really stick or land in the original version um but it's great there doesn't seem to be any restrictions on on the show but on the flip side of it we have the American version which seems to be very closely mimicking the British version but the big issue is and I think the reason why is is why I didn't really like it was because some of the humor 
it, it's gone. It, it's not there. Like, the inappropriate moments. Like, I mean, I'm not talking about anything raunchy, but they're, they make some inappropriate comments that I guess you can't have on network television. And so it loses part of its charm. And... Yeah, I, I I think I once again I do like Malin Bialik, but I just don't think she's quite right for the role. Um, I think they're trying to do the like over the top, and it it just really doesn't work for her. Um, with her co stars, you also have uh, Leslie Jordan and Kyla Pratt. Now, Kyla Pratt, I really haven't been familiar with anything she's done in recent years, if she has been on anything in the recent years. And you have Leslie Jordan, who was coming off of, um, ooh, I'm forgetting the name of it now, but he actually was in a show last year uh, that, that centered around a bunch of older men. Or, or, or older people in general in a retirement home, I think. Um, I actually like Leslie Jordan. He is quirky. He's kind of funny. No matter what role he's in, he brings the same kind of charm to each of the roles. And I feel like, in a sense, he could have been or is sort of the show's saving grace. But, yeah, it, it just, once again, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the writing and my Bialik just there there's such a loss of charm i i can't really say it any more than that and i stopped watching it weeks ago if you would have caught me you know right after i had stopped watching it because i had talked to like my mom who watches it and a couple of friends who watched it i i had a lot more to say and a lot more details to say about it all right so kind of going into the next show we have the great north um I don't really actually have a ton to say about this show. It's a decent show. The show is actually uh, renewed uh, for a second season way before the first season ever premiered. Um, It stars Nick Offerman, Jenny Slate, Will Forte, and um, they're in the Great North. They're in Alaska, and and it's all about Nick Offerman and his very weird, quirky family. He's also a divorced father of four children, um, one of his kids has an imaginary friend who happens to be Alanis Morissette. She can only see her in Aurora Borealis. Um, it's just really weird. It's, it's a really weird, quirky show. It very, very, very much reminds me of Bob's Burgers. Um, so if you're a fan of Bob's Burgers, odds are you will like this show. I do like Bob's Burgers. I still watch it. Uh, if I'm being honest, Bob's Burgers is starting to draw me just a little, but I still really like it. Um, but I think for me, in terms of the actual humor of it all, aside from the weird, awkward nature of most of these characters, it doesn't really bring anything new to me. Um, so I have also stopped watching this show. Um, but I think it could be interesting enough to check out. And like I said, especially if you do like Bob's Burgers, it is also on Fox, so... You know, it's it's all a part of that, um, I don't know what they call it now, but they used to call it anima- animation domination. Going on to the next show, we have Kenan. Um, I love Kenan Thompson. I loved him ever since I was a kid uh, on Kenan and Kel, on all of that. He's been on SNL, and, I, and I've always really liked him. Um, he stars in a show... With his name, and he is a morning time talk show host um, called Wake Up with Keenan, or at least I believe that's what it is called. Um, and he is a widower and father of two, and oftentimes the uh, father in law and his manager pop in and out of his home. And um, yeah, it, it's. It's an NBC show, and you can definitely get that feeling, especially if you've watched something like 30 Rock. Um, I think it's got charm. I think it's cute, um, but not very funny, if I'm being completely honest. Um, I think also the number one thing that really bothers me about this show is its cinematography. The show is shot very similar to, I believe, 30 Rock, which I have not seen that in years, but it's almost shot in that mockumentary style, but it's got, it's the subtle mockumentary style. It's not something as drastic as something like The Office, but... It still has a lot of uh, quick readjustment, readjustments, zooms, 
um, which actually I find to be extremely distracting, and it feels quite lazy. Um, I believe this is a single-camera setup show, which, I mean, a lot of sitcoms are. Um, and I don't know what the new restrictions are because of the pandemic, but I'd imagine that that might in part be why they, they shot it that way, is just to kind of really pump these episodes out. Uh, one of the head writers, um, or, or I'm sorry, one of the, the co-creators was also a head writer for Superstore, which I absolutely love Superstore, and I'm actually going to get into Superstore for our next segment. Um, but he's been working on the show for a while, and he knew that he wanted Keenan Thompson to be a part of it, and they, they changed the names for it a bit. So, you know, hearing that the co-creator was one of the head writers for Superstore, I had a little bit of higher hopes for this show. Um, if you definitely want something, you know, easy to watch after a day at work, um, you know, something that maybe you could get invested in, but not too invested in, then I think something like Keenan would be your type of show. Um, I also really am finding it interesting that these shows nowadays, there's been more and more where you have, uh, men, you know, who are the widowers, uh, and, and it being focused around them and them being parents, but also, I guess, kind of getting on with their lives. Uh, I don't feel like I've seen a whole lot of that in, in television, or especially in the recent years. But you have this and you have The Unicorn. Um, but unfortunately, Kenan is another show that I have stopped watching. So going on to the last show, the last show is Young Rock. Um, which, not a fan of the name, but I actually am a fan of the show. Uh, Young Rock is literally about The Rock as a kid. As a kid, a teenager, and uh, just in college. So it follows, the show follows actually over the course of four different time periods. Uh, I believe the first one, he's around eight years old. The second one, he is about 16. And then the third, he's about 19. Um, And they used three different actors to portray The Rock. And then in the fourth timeline, it is like twenty, the 2030s, and he's running for president. And he wants to be completely open about who he is, the things he's done, who his family were, you know. It's really interesting and it's it's unique and it's the characters are well written and we know that the story is true or at least true to an extent because i mean let's be real for a second you know it's a tv show and sometimes truth's not or the you know reality of people's lives aren't super entertaining so they need to embellish here or there um they have four episodes out so far and two of them you know they focused on the teenage uh, version of The Rock, which I actually find to be the most interesting storyline because when you have the kid version of The Rock, it's actually following more so the parents and the their initial um, rise to fame because, for those who don't know, but The Rock, his father, was Rocky Johnson who used to uh, wrestle in the early days of the WWF, now known as the WWE. So you get to see a lot of cameos of the classic wrestlers, some of which that are definitely a little bit before my time, but still people that I knew growing up from, you know, WWF, WWE, uh, and just other, you know, media like Andre the Giant, for instance, who was also in The Princess Bride. It was really cool to see who they casted for all of these people, like the Iron Sheik and Ric Flair. Like, the casting is really well done for this show. It's well written, it's well casted, it's well acted. Um, even even the child actor, he brings, you know, enough flair to, to his role, even though, once again, he is not the primary focus. Um, I think, you know, each part of of the four timelines are focused very well like i said before the youngest version of the rock it's actually more about the parents and i think because it's you know as a child 
you're you're not really you. You're not you haven't really come into your own. So he's the observer. He's observing the you know the parents rise, but also their struggle. Then as the teenage version, as you are coming into yourself, you know, you also realize the reality of the world. And so they talk about a lot of the financial problems and the father's very egotistical, which I find that the show actually if you know, Rocky Johnson was really like this, it almost paints him into a little bit of a negative light. And the college years of The Rock we haven't actually gotten a ton of yet so I can't really comment on that but it seems like he has put in a lot of the effort of you know of building his reputation to a certain level but then him still interacting with his dad who's got this big ego and is trying to help his son out but is potentially making things worse because he likes to embellish and lie a lot um, and then the, you know, most, you know, the rock from the 2030s is kind of narrating the whole thing um, because that is the present for the show. All right, so we're going to take another quick break before we get into the next segment, which is going to be actually my weekly lineup. Um, I watch a lot of TV shows, um, but this is going to be more focusing on the the shows that actually come out Sunday through Saturday and, and what I watch during those days. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast podcast itch whatever it may be visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com follow us on facebook and twitter and download us on itunes soundcloud and google play And we are back. So for the next segment, I'm just going to kind of run through my general weekly lineup. Um, I, like I said, watch a number of TV shows, probably too much in a single year, actually. Um, But the ones that I'm going to be going through are just the ones that are actually on network television that air uh, Sunday through Saturday. Now, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head, I do not have any shows that actually air on Monday or Saturday, just Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So, starting off at the beginning of the week, I have three shows that come on on Sundays. I have The Simpsons, Bob's Burgers, and Good Girls. Then, on Tuesday, I have Young Rock, Keenan, which I actually do not watch anymore, uh, Mixedish, and Blackish. On Thursdays, I have... Or Wednesdays, I have the Goldbergs. Thursdays, I have Superstore. And then Fridays, I will have whatever Marvel show is coming on, which WandaVision is now finished as of this recording, which is obvious because that was what the first segment was. But next Friday, or the Friday after that actually, is going to be Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So I'm actually very interested about that, which I'll touch upon that towards the end of this segment. So kind of just going into it, um, The Simpsons is about three quarters of the way done its current season. It is on season 32, which is insane when you think about it. The Simpsons originally started with a holiday special in 1989. Um, I mean, before that, it was on the Tracy Ullman show as, you know, quick, uh, like 30 second to minute segments. Um, but it's crazy that there's actually been 32 seasons of The Simpsons, and we've had a movie on top of that. Now, the first season was 
13 episodes or less, but the rest of them have been around 20 episodes, you know, 20 episodes, maybe 24 episodes at, at its absolute most. But it's kind of crazy because I feel like the past five to six seasons have not been the greatest. You can, um, especially about five or six seasons ago, you could especially feel the influence that uh, shows like Family Guy were having on The Simpsons because I feel like they felt as if to stay relevant, they needed to, you know, mimic certain gags, which personally I think actually really decreased the quality of The Simpsons for me. But this season's actually been really good. Uh, it really reminds me of a lot of the original episodes of The Simpsons. There was that charm that was back in place, because the first 12 seasons of The Simpsons are is, they're really good seasons, they're really top-notch. But uh, one episode in particular that I really enjoyed uh, this season, The Simpsons, it starts out with The Simpsons at a uh, art museum, and they're looking at a uh, piece of um, ancient like Roman art, and then it's a whole, uh, you know flashback episode in which they incorporate historical figures, the Simpsons into historical figures, um, that they call are more specifically Bartigula, which is Caligula. Uh, so it's very interesting. Definitely reminded me of a, um, older episode of the Simpsons and I definitely would recommend watching it. Um, Bob's Burgers is on its 11th season this year. Um, we're about three quarters of the way through the season as well. Um, I've liked some of the episodes this season. I haven't disliked any of them, but then I also found a number of them that were just like, eh, okay, I mean, that was my, you know, 20 minutes to pass the time or just to eat something, you know, before I go to, got to go to bed because I, like, worked late or something that night. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that Bob's Burgers is, is losing its charm. Yeah, I don't know. If anyone feels any differently, I, I, I'd be very curious to hear about that. Um, now, we just had the start of Good Girls Season 4. Um, I actually am an episode behind as of this podcast, um, and I won't go too far into it. But for anyone interested, Good Girls is actually a really good show. Uh, when I first heard about it, it was sort of like in passing, and I thought that it might be more of, you know, female-angled show, which honestly really hasn't stopped me in the past. I, I, I'll watch almost anything, really. I'll, I'll watch kid shows. I'll watch shows geared towards women, teenagers, old people, you know. I'm, I'm, I like a, a very wide range of television shows. But Good Girls is is about three moms, uh, two, uh, one of which is a housewife, and they're all having their own sort of financial troubles, and they come to the conclusion that they need money, and they need money fast. So, one of the girls works at a grocery store, and let's just say the series kicks off with them planning a, you know, robbery, and it's all about their descent into crime. I feel like this show really reminds me of Breaking Bad, if anyone loves Breaking Bad. But there there are so many fun, really funny moments in this show. Whereas if Breaking Bad was, you know, much more dramatic. And this is a drama too, uh, don't get me wrong. But it, it's got a really nice balance of, of drama of comedy and, you know, just general nice twists and turns. Um, so I would definitely plan on checking that out if you haven't already. Now, I have already talked about Young Rock and Keenan in my last segment. Um, like I said, I am no longer watching Keenan. Um, Young Rock, I am continuing to watch. Um, the other shows like uh, Call Me Cat, uh, The Great North... Uh, I believe those shows were both Sunday nights and probably Tuesday nights as well. Um, but once again, those three shows are no longer a part of my lineup. Uh, but we have Mixish and Blackish. Now, Blackish uh, was the first of what it now has three spinoffs and a fourth one coming right around the corner. Um, or, or, or two spinoffs and a third one coming right around the corner. Blackish is about a black family um the wife is mixed uh white and black and the kids are also mixed as well and they you know have 
come into, you know, money through, you know, hard work and, and stuff like that, not through inheritance or anything. Uh, the mom is an anesthesiologist, so she makes bank. The uh, father is um, a partner at an ad agency, so he makes good money too. And the father realizes right in the beginning of the series that the kids are not in touch with you know, the black side of them, you know, culturally speaking. So that's why it's called Black-ish. Now, Mixed-ish is about the mom when she was a kid growing up being biracial and their family is very was very progressive for the time and they actually originally lived on a commune so it's not only about coming to terms with being biracial but also about the young main character Bo navigating her her middle school and high school you know lives uh just socially it's very interesting i don't think it has that kick that Blackish has, um, but still very eye opening, insightful. Blackish is also really well done and very eye opening. Um, I've heard people say online, you know, that they don't like to be preached at, so to speak, but I don't say that the show is preaching at anyone. Um, I'd say that you have a black family, and with a black family, you have a whole different set of, you know, family or daily struggles as opposed to a white family that you see all the time in television and you have since, you know, the 50s. I mean, if you want to go back even further, you know, the shows that were on the radio, you have it then too. So it's just a different kind of struggle and I think it actually, you know, gives you a great understanding. Um, just go into it with an open mind and I think you could not only get really great entertainment out of it, but, you know, you might actually leave with, you know, something more than just that. So on Wednesdays, I have the Goldbergs, which I'm not going to say a whole lot about it. I've been watching the Goldbergs. Um, I started watching, I think, right after season two ended. I went back, watched season one and two, and I love that show. Um, it is based off of Adam F. Goldberg's real life, and he documented, like, everything as a kid. They came from, you know, an upper-class family in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania. Um, very, very neurotic family. Um, and for the first about five seasons, the show was really well done. Um, but then season six came around and, you know, the quirks of the family started to run a little dry. And then by last season, season seven, because they're on season eight right now, season seven, you have these same characters that you've been, you know, following for so long and they're not changing and their quirks are no longer funny. They actually come off extremely, you know, entitled, selfish, rude, um, and now in season eight, it's it's the same thing. And I've actually noticed a lot of online reception feels the same way. You have characters that don't learn from their mistakes, and it is the same issues these characters are running into dressed in a different light. Every single time, the mom is extremely overbearing. She did something that way, 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 way crossed the line. And so it's like, how can you dress that up? you know, 20 times in, like, two seasons, you know, so it, that show's getting, you know, really old. Um, moving on to the end of the week for me, which is Thursday, because like I said, my Friday shows are done right now, and I don't have anything on Mondays and Saturdays, we have Superstore. Superstore is a phenomenal, phenomenal show. If you are a fan of of something like The Office, you will love Superstore. Hell, you don't even have to watch or like The Office to like Superstore. Uh, Superstore is not done in a mockumentary form, but the reason I compare it to The Office is for two reasons. One, one of the producers of The Office is actually uh, was part of the production team getting Superstore off the ground. And I actually did mention Superstore in an earlier segment as well, which when I was talking about Keenan, one of the head writers of Superstore jumped 
you know, to be a co-creator for Keenan. Um, but Superstore is about a group of people who work in a big box store, you know, very similar to Walmart. And it's just about, you know, their daily lives and the, the crap that goes on in that store, which if you've ever worked retail in your life or if you've ever been to a big box store like Walmart, I think you can find a humor in a lot of the stuff that goes on in that show. Um, the show oftentimes will break the, uh, you know, the three act structure up or even certain segments up with just like a good five second clip of a customer doing something so random, but so funny. Um, something that you, you definitely would see people do in, you know, a Walmart. And especially if you've ever been a fan of the website People of Walmart, you know, the the, the stuff that you see on that website, it, it feels like it, that's the stuff that you're going to see on this show as well with those little segments. But it pretty much has an ensemble cast, um, and each of the characters are very unique, very quirky, and you can you can tell very early on that each of those characters are on a certain path. You know, they, they have their character arc. Um, you might not know where the character arc is going, but you know that it, they're going somewhere, and you can see that over the course of the six seasons. Unfortunately, though, one of the main cast members, America Ferreira, decided that the fifth season was going to be her last season. Uh, she had just given birth to, I think, her second kid, and she was just busy in general, so she wanted to kind of step away from, you know, acting for a bit. And so... We had that, and then we had COVID hit, which also really messed with the show. And so, unfortunately, they're canceling the show now. Um, they decided that this season was going to be its last season, and the finale is going to be in another, uh, I believe it's another week from now. It's going to be an hour-long finale. But I can already see the end in sight. It feels like they knew that this was happening, and they're ending it on their turns terms, which is really uh, nice. That way we don't get, you know, cut right in the middle of some sort of plot. But they have actually announced a spinoff, uh, two of the characters, uh, one of which has just been a reoccurring character, but two of the characters are getting their own spinoff show. Uh, so I'm very curious to see where they're going to go with that, and you bet that I am going to watch those shows or that that spinoff but I, I say you should definitely give it um a watch you could probably find the whole series on hulu still uh you would only have you know four or five seasons to catch up on and i'm sure the sixth season has been released on there as well um but as of now that is my lineup i do have some shows coming back in the future uh i think in the next couple weeks and then even in the summertime uh, most notably Manifest, which is a very interesting uh, sci-fi mystery show. If you're a fan of Lost, you might like Manifest as well. You should check into that before Season 3 starts. Not a whole lot of episodes, so you can probably quickly get caught up. Alright, on that note, we are going to take a break, and we're going to end it with the five hidden gems of shows that I have watched this year. I highly suggest listening in for that. We'll be back. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. And we're back for the final segment of this podcast, which is the five hidden gems that I have started this year. So uh, before we get into it, just a little uh, transparency. 
one of the shows I have already watched before. It I actually watched it twice before, but it has been years since I had watched it. Um, but it had been just uh, recently re-released on streaming services, and uh, I had to revisit it. So we'll get to that shortly. But topping off at the uh, the top of my list, really, and it's the show that has the most seasons out of all of this, um, is Mr. Robot. I actually just started the fourth and final season uh, two nights ago. Um, it has four seasons. The first season's ten episodes. The second season is twelve episodes. Third season, I believe, is ten again, and the final season is thirteen. Uh, for anyone that binge watches, I'm not a binge watcher, but you could probably get through it pretty quick. Um, I wouldn't recommend binge watching, though. I personally really never recommend binge watching. There's a lot of information, and there's a lot of little subtle moments that you can definitely miss if you're not quite paying attention. Um, but it is so well done. Um, the show is about a hacker named Elliot, played by Remy Malik, uh, which in the more recent years, people should definitely be familiar with Remy Malik. Um, you know, back in the mid 2000s, he was on the war at home as uh, Kenny. Uh, then he was in other shows uh, like Bojack Horseman more recently, Legend of Korra. Um, he was on Until Dawn about a year after, um, Mr. Robot first got released, but I think two of the bigger franchises or things that you might know him from is the Night at the Museum trilogy, or at least I believe it's a trilogy of films, as well as the, uh, Queen movie, Bohemian Rhapsody, where he played Freddie Mercury. But anyway, going back to the actual show, uh, the show originally came out in, I believe, 2015. 15, if I'm not mistaken, and it, like I said, stars uh, Elliot, who is a hacker, and he sort of sees the injustices of the world, and he sort of wants to help people and help the greater good. Now, aside from the fact that I think you kind of have to be a little smart to to hack, he is is very, very smart. Um, he doesn't like people touching him, he doesn't talk too too often he's got a bunch of little weird quirks um they never quite come out and say if he is autistic but they do kind of lean towards you know giving hints that he might be autistic and uh he also has a lot of childhood trauma which you know plays into his character as well i don't want to really give too much into the show but i would say if you have a moment just watch the first 10 minutes of the first episode. That right there clearly shows you what that show's about. And if you don't like it after those 10 minutes, I then I guess the show's not for you. Um, but it is very, very, very well done. Also, it's very unique cinematography. Um, most, you know, TV shows will film with, um, you know... Especially in dialogue sequences, they'll film a half and half shot, you know, shot reverse shot with characters being on the left and then the reverse shot being on the right. This show uses a lot of negative space in uh, in its cinematography, which I mean, even after three seasons now, they they don't use that technique too too much in the later seasons. But I still wonder why why they do that. But it gives it a very unique look. It almost reminds me of something very similar to Breaking Bad, or even more so, uh, Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul has a lot of very unique shots like that. Moving on to the next hidden gem, uh, one of my coworkers actually told me about this show that is also on Amazon Prime called Zero Zero Zero. Um, it is a show that takes place with. Three different sets of characters from three different countries, Italy, Mexico, and the U.S., um, and it's all about the production, distribution, and uh, selling of cocaine, uh, which I didn't know this before the show, but 000 is a nickname for, I guess, like, very pure uh, cocaine, um, which also, 000, is 
what is known as a type of, um, I guess, a uh, like pasta flour, which is where the nickname for cocaine comes from. Um, so it's really interesting. You have a family struggle for um, this family of organized crime. It's a grandson and a grandfather. Um, so very, very interesting on that uh, front. And they're the people that are buying and distributing distributing the uh, cocaine. Then in Mexico, you have the production of cocaine. Um, and you follow essentially a military task force that um, definitely is corrupt. Not everyone, but there are certain soldiers that are corrupt and, and working for the drug cartels down there. And then in the United States, you have a very interesting storyline in which you have a family of brokers, um, and they they ship the cocaine from Mexico to Italy. Um, yeah, very, very, very interesting. And you also have multiple languages in this film. You have Spanish, you have English, you have Italian. Um... I forget what the other language is, but at one point they are in an African country on the western coast, and so you get a lot of that, and then they're in the Middle East at another point. So you get a lot of, a lot of different locations, a lot of languages, very well-constructed story, well-thought-out characters, and all of this is actually based off a book. Now, I'm nearing the end of the season right now, where I only have a couple episodes left, Um. From what I'm gathering, and I don't like to do research on shows like this that have already finished their run, or, or even based off books, because I don't want anything to be ruined, but if I had to take a guess, I, I feel like this show knows where it's headed, knows where it's ending, and that will be that. Uh, I think it'll probably be only a one-season thing, but nonetheless has been a very good viewing experience so far. The uh, third show is Your Honor, um, which I am now halfway done with that. I believe the season had wrapped up about a month ago at this point. Um, stars Brian Cranston um, as a judge. Um, and long story short, his son um, accidentally kills a kid um, and is dealing with the guilt of killing this kid in the hit and run while his father who once again is a judge he is help helping cover up his son's crime um i don't want to get too far into the details of that show because there are quite a few twists but this show is really good, really well written, and very, very, very well acted, which is something you should pretty much expect from someone like Brian Cranston. Um, I'd say, generally speaking, you are getting a lot of no-name actors in this show, um, which sometimes I really, really enjoy because I can kind of focus on the show and... When you have no-name actors, it's kind of a hard feeling to describe, but there's something fresh about it, and you're not so focused on this actor and his other body of work. Now, I've gotten sucked into Brian Cranston being this judge, so I often forget about, you know, more of his famous roles of, you know, being in Breaking Bad and even Malcolm in the Middle, which is where I had originally seen Brian Cranston when I was a kid, because I loved Malcolm in the Middle. Um, but this show is really heavy, and I have never actually experienced a show like this. The first couple episodes alone, there is such a continuous feeling of intense dread and anxiety and suspense. It's, it's, it's insane. I have never felt something like this before in a TV show. But really, really interesting. Um, obviously, it is a, you know, crime show essentially. Um, like I said, I don't like looking up things, but I noticed that when I did, uh, you know, click on the show on Showtime, because it's a Showtime show, it says 2022 dash with an empty space. So there might be a possibility for a second season. Um, as the way things are going right now, I, I don't imagine there is a very, very good outcome for this show. Um, not from a critical standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint. So moving on to the fourth show, we have a show called Dark. Um, I originally started it 
last year during the pandemic, but then the final season, the third and final season, didn't actually come out till the very end of the year, and I didn't actually start watching till this year. Um, it's a Netflix show, and at that, it's actually a foreign show on Netflix. I believe it is based out of Germany. Um, it is a sci-fi mystery, that's what I'll say. It's definitely sci-fi, but it's got a very, very good uh, mystery element to it. The show essentially takes place over the course of three different decades. It takes place in uh, 57, 77, or no, no, 57, 87, and 2017. Um, it's kind of like an every, uh, you know, 30 years sort of thing. Um, that show, aside from the fact that it is foreign, you can actually put on the English dub if you do not like reading subtitles. But me personally, in a show like this especially, I don't mind reading the subtitles. I mean, I've watched a lot of foreign films and a lot of foreign shows in general. So reading subtitles is not a big deal to me. Um, but regardless, it's definitely a show that has an insane mystery to it, and you definitely want to pay attention to. Um, you do not want to be looking at your phone or half paying attention because you could very easily miss a detail. But the cool thing about this is, and it kind of even reminds me of Young Rock, but two different shows, but I say the reason it reminds me of Young Rock, or really Young Rock should remind me of Dark, is because over the course of these three different time periods, these three different um, decades, you get the same characters. So you have characters that are adults back in the 50s. Then you have them as, or even some of the characters are kids in the 50s. So then in the 80s, you have them as adults or elderly people. And then some of the kids from the 80s are adults and have their own kids in 2017. So it's very interesting and it's all connected, but essentially it follows Four different families. There are a lot of characters in this show. A lot of information to absorb. But you can also tell with this show that they pretty much thought this entire show out from the beginning. There are no twists and turns that they're coming up with spur of the moment with all these plot holes. It's it's amazing. You really should get the chance to check it out. Um... The beginning alone, watching the first 10 minutes, similar to what I said about Mr. Robot, that right there should hook you in. Um, it's kind of got like a uh, WTF sort of moment in the beginning, but you just want to know more. Like, why did that just happen? So then you watch more and, you know, the mystery will start to unfold. So going on to the last show, we have Freaks and Geeks. Now, this is a show I have seen before. I saw it when I was a kid. I saw it when I was a teenager. And I just recently rewatched it again. They had released it on Hulu. And I think maybe at one point years ago, it was on Netflix. Um, but I'm fairly certain for a long time, it was actually off all streaming services. You know, you might have been able to buy it on Amazon, but I mean, it's not free. It wasn't free to stream. But this show, unfortunately, was cut too soon. It only did last one season, which I believe the network, which might have been ABC... Mm, I think it might have actually been NBC... And I could just be making that up. But regardless, the network doesn't really matter. But whatever the network was originally that had aired it, they aired the episodes, one season's worth of episodes, well over a year. And sort of out of order. Which not only is confusing for people, but the inconsistency can really mess with people's heads. Um, and make people really just forget and not care about a show. But the really cool thing about Freaks and Geeks is, is that the cast in Freaks and Geeks, and this show came out in 1999, so it was filmed, um, it was probably filmed in, in 1998 slash 1999, but there were a lot of really well-known actors just getting their career started. You had Busy Phillips, you had Linda Cardinelli, you had, uh, Martin Starr, you had Seth Rogen, you had, um... James Franco, I mean, that's just to name a few, um, a lot of really, really well-known actors. 
But essentially, uh, with this show, the show is broken up into two primary groups, which is what the show is also called. You have the freaks and you have the geeks. The freaks are your kind of burnouts, you know, your your pot smokers, you know, people that are seen as degenerates or scum. And you have your geeks, which is exactly what it is geeks um the geeks are the younger characters they are you know freshmen in high school whereas the freaks are um i believe they're in their junior year of of high school um but the show more so focuses around Lindsay weir and sam weir Lindsay was a like a goody two-shoe who um, which they dive into a little bit, and I won't go too far into it, but she's had a little bit of a rough summer, and she decides she's done with that whole act, so she kind of joins in with the freaks, and she's kind of trying to discover herself in a way. Then you have Sam Weir, who is Lin- Lindsay's younger brother, and he is, he's a geek. He likes to play D&D, he likes comic books, he likes science fiction, all that kind of stuff. And it's with him and his two best friends, and they're just kind of navigating high school and bullies. Um, And they come from a pretty, you know, good uh, family, probably upper middle class, conservative, especially for the 80s. Their house is definitely really nice, so you know they had a little bit more money. Um, But it's, it's a very interesting show, very quirky and very funny. Um, I think everyone could really find something humorous in it, and I think everyone alone can find, you know, it very funny or get a kick out of the fact that there are so many well-known actors before they were well-known in this show. It's just very strange. It's like it's a breeding ground for, you know, the A-listers nowadays. But anyway, you can definitely go check that whole series out, um, and I and it's a pretty quick watch. Definitely a show that if you choose to, you could binge watch and, and be done with pretty quickly. I believe it's around 18 episodes long. And you can see them all on Hulu. Uh, Hulu has them in the proper viewing order as well. Alright, so on that note, Thank you for listening to the GSMC Television Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show, and please write a nice little review that really helps us out. Also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.